Joseph's story begins. I hope that uh, you will enjoy this journey as much as I will. It's one of my favorite sections of Scripture and one of my favorite persons from Scripture. So how do you deal with this story without reading the chapter? We cannot read in the Sunday morning service every single word of every single chapter, and I know that. But this morning, there's just so much in the 37th chapter that I need for you to get the story that I am going to read all 36 verses. Uh, we're going to read it together. So take your pew Bible, follow with me. It's page 38, first book of the Bible, Genesis, page 38. And uh, we'll see what this, oh, Joel, you're ahead of me again. Bless you. You do not need your pew Bible. You're welcome to use it if you would like to, but Joel, do you have the whole chapter up, Joel? Thank you so very, very much. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Cana. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been given to him in his old age and he had made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the thing in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. So he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer they said to each other come now let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him then we'll see what comes of his dreams when Reuben heard this he tried to rescue him from their hands let's not take his life he said don't shed any blood throw him down into the cistern here in the desert but don't lay a hand on him Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father so when Joseph came to his brothers they stripped him of his robe the richly ornamented robe he was wearing and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't here. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. 
Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Lord, help us to see this morning just exactly what happens when we get started down the road of sin. Help us, Lord, to be keenly aware of your finger touching our lives this day. Challenge us to look inside. In Jesus' name, amen. Since childhood, most of us have heard the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors. When the story was told, the focus was usually on the beautiful coat or the relationship between Joseph and his father Jacob or the aftermath of this event and the intense grief of Jacob. Rarely was much said about Joseph's brothers. But it is my opinion that that is where the focus should be in attempting to understand this chapter of Scripture and the next chapters all the way to Genesis chapter 50. The coat of many colors is a homey element of the story. So is the relationship between Joseph and Jacob and the resulting intense grief of Jacob. But the real issue is why? Why would ten older brothers, with the exception of Reuben, the eldest, hate a 17-year-old so much that they would plot to kill him and then soften their plot slightly by selling him to some trade merchants from the east. Why did this happen? The event occurred for only one possible reason. Sin. Not too often do we hear the word sin today. Our society and even the church prefers words that are not quite as harsh as the word sin. We use mistake error in judgment, backsliding, falling away, and then, the best of all, inappropriate relationship or behavior. They're all better than the word sin. But sin is still sin. And St. Paul's definition in Romans chapter 3.23 has more credibility, even more credibility, in the 21st century than it did in the 1st century. One look at the newspaper. One look at CBC News. It's awful what is going on in our world. And Paul's words, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, was never truer than it is in the present day. From a biblical standpoint, a good definition of the word sin is falling short of God's design for us as human beings. Another way of putting it, another definition, is missing the mark as an archer misses the bullseye at which he or she might be shooting. So if it's sin that is at the heart of this Joseph story and the thing that propels all the rest of the other events, how then did Joseph's brothers sin? Well, I'm going to suggest to you three things that happen in this story, and one builds on the other. Progression takes place. The first sin that we can identify is the sin of jealousy. And where I see that is in verse 2 of 37 of Genesis. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. I know what you're thinking. Here is the evidence that Joseph sinned, the consummate tattletale. It's not his brothers who sinned, it's Joseph. No wonder his brothers didn't like him. Although we are not told what the bad report contained, the author 
gives us a clue as to the nature of the brother's sins against Joseph by describing precisely who the brothers are. Nothing in Scripture is there by accident. And in verse 2, the brothers that Joseph is, are with, is with are not named. But their mothers are. Verse 2 says that they were the sons of Bilhal and Zilpah. Okay, so what is all that about? Because understanding verse 2 is part of understanding, again, the rest of 37, which helps us with the whole Joseph side. Now let me do a little history with you. This is Old Testament history, so hang on, put on your seatbelt. You've got to get this, because this is so intriguing to me. Jacob, the father of these 12 sons, worked seven years for a man named Laban who was the father of Rachel in order that Jacob could have Rachel's hand in marriage. Well, you remember the Old Testament story. Instead of Rachel, Laban deceived him and gave him Rachel's older sister Leah. Jacob wakes up in the morning after the honeymoon and he looks and he says, ah, it's Leah. I didn't work seven years for you. I worked seven years for Rachel. Anyway, ancient times, the firstborn daughter goes first. And so that's what Laban had in mind. He did not tell Jacob that. It was the custom of those times, 1800 BC, for the father of the bride to give a maidservant to the bride as a wedding gift. Leah received Zilpah, now we're starting to get there. And Rachel received Bilhal. Rachel has Bilhal and Leah has Zilpah. Okay. So Rachel and Leah both end up as the wives of Jacob, as well as these two other women. The plot thickens. All of, it, this is all in the Bible, I guarantee you. You may not believe it, but it's there. Genesis chapter 30. Leah begins to have children. Rachel cannot conceive. Rachel is so angry that Leah is having children, including Reuben, the firstborn, and that she is unable, that she gives Bilhal, her maidservant, to Jacob. Jacob and Bilhal have sex, and she, over the course of time, has two children by Jacob, Dan and Naphtali. Well, after having four children, Leah becomes barren, and she doesn't like the fact now that Zilpah is having kids by Jacob. This is how we get the 12 tribes of Israel, believe it or not. No kidding. This is the 12 tribes of Israel. Dan and Naphtali and the other two that we're going to have right now, Gad and Asher, are part of the 12 tribes of Israel. So Leah decides that now that she cannot conceive, she's going to take a cue from Rachel. And she gives her handmaid, Zilpah, to Jacob. And Gad and Asher are born to Zilpah. Now, back to 37 verse 2. These are the four children of Jacob that Joseph is tending flocks with. They are not Leah's children. They are not Rachel's children. They are the handmade children. And Jacob does something that a wise parent shouldn't do. He has favorites. Joseph is the favorite. Benjamin will be later after Benjamin is born later than, this, than right now. And Joseph takes this, whatever happened, back to Jacob about these four boys of his that Jacob has a hard time with anyway. So who is J Joseph's mother? Ah, who is Joseph's mother? Joseph's mother is Rachel. Rachel eventually is able to conceive a child 
and it is Joseph, and then it will be Benjamin. She dies bearing Benjamin later on down the road. And so you have this 12 children, but unbelievable stuff going on in the family. Just unreal. So, what's going on here? My, my theory is that those four children, those four sons of the two handmaids didn't like Joseph from the day he was born. And when Joseph takes the bad report back to them, back to Jacob about them, they're just as jealous as they can possibly be. That's where the jealousy comes from. Yes, jealousy is a sin. It's wrong to wish that you were someone you are not. Period. Because you are not a cosmic accident, but you have been designed by the great designer. God knew that those four boys of Jacob born to the handmaids would be part of the 12 tribes of Israel. God made each of us in his image before you were born, God knew you. Jeremiah says, before I found you, formed you in the womb, I knew you. David says in the 139th Psalm, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You have value in and of yourself, not in comparison to someone else. Gad and Asher, Dan and Naphtali had value without being compared to Joseph and later Benjamin. The only person you should ever compare yourself to is yourself. I learned that on the track field. Harry F. Anderson, my track coach. I've told lots of Harry F. Anderson stories. Harry F. Anderson used to say to us, I don't care what your time is compared to the person you were running against. I want to know if your time today was better than your time yesterday. That's the issue. It's not who we are in comparison to someone else. It's in who we are in comparison to who we are and what God is doing in our lives. Jealousy is sin, and jealousy will destroy a relationship with another person faster than anything else because jealousy also leads to another sin. And, of course, we're ratcheting this thing up now. So where are we quickly? We're at hatred. Sure, Jacob should not have played favorites. The coat was a little much. The richly ornamented robe had the connotation of royal dress. Jacob's love for his son by Rachel was obvious without the coat. Verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Jacob was wrong. There's no debating it. But the brothers were wrong too. They could have said, Jacob's an old man, he knows better, but we won't let our emotions get the best of us. Rather than that, their hatred intensifies. They ratchet the thing up. So it goes from jealousy, secondly, to hatred. Now we're going to get it to another level because it always does that. It never stops where it starts. Because every sin starts in the heart. And so that's where it started with these brothers, in the heart. It was jealousy. And then it led to hatred. And then it led to hatred with a plot line. And that hatred, the plot line, is evil. The last straw is those dreams. The first dream was that his brothers would bow down to him. The second was that his father and stepmother Leah, because Rachel is now dead, would also bow down to him. Jacob struggled with the dream, but it's interesting the scripture says in verse 11, he bore it in mind, kind of like Mary bore it in mind, some of the things that she experienced in the early years of Jesus' life, kept it in her heart. This verse 11, Jacob bore it in mind. The jealousy increased. Let's kill him. Verse 19 and 20. Here comes that dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes 
of his dreams. Of course, little did they know they were going to feed right into the dream. Now, interesting to me that Reuben is the intervener here. Because Reuben is the first child of the twelve. And he's Leah's son. And Joseph is Rachel's first son, the eleventh child. But it's, it's Reuben that intervenes. And I find that really interesting. I, I don't know whether it's the firstborn thing, the protector kind of thing, or what it is. But he, he's not even Joseph's brother in terms of, of who his mother is. But he tries to intervene. But before he can actually intervene, while he is away, the Midianite merchants arrive, and Joseph is sold for 20 shekels of silver. That's eight ounces if you're doing the comparison to our way of measuring, 0.2 kilograms. In other words, not very much. And at the end of the chapter, Joseph is being sold at auction in Egypt. He lands up with Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, which again is going to set up the rest of this whole story. Jacob, however, is in deep never comes out of it until chapter 43 when he finds out that Joseph, his son, is actually still alive. But it all started with jealousy. And then jealousy was wedded to hatred. And then hatred created a plot of evil because every sin starts in the heart. That's where it festers. That's where it brews. Sin. Is it possible for us to be so attuned to the Spirit of God that we can see sin coming and say no? Is it possible to be conscious of the beginning stages of jealousy, hatred, or whatever else that sin might lead to and say, no, I will not do this? Absolutely it is. That's the whole Christian gospel. That when we come into a faith relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus comes inside of us. And it gives us the power, the discernment, first of all, and then the power to see the train coming and to say, I'm getting off this track before it hits me. Is it possible for us to see sin coming and say no? Yes, absolutely. You see, there's, there's no way to read this 37th chapter of Genesis without thinking about Jesus. Look at the, the similarities between Joseph and Jesus. In fact, Joseph has been called the most Christ-like of all the Old Testament characters. Joseph, his death is plotted. Jesus, his death is plotted. Joseph is stripped of a robe. Jesus stripped of his clothes. Joseph thrown into a cistern. Jesus nailed to a cross. Joseph sold for 20 shekels of silver. Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. But that's where the comparison stops and one great contrast emerges. Joseph's blood was not spilt. It was an animal's blood into which Joseph's coat of many colors was dipped. Jesus' blood was spilled. It was from his own body that blood and water came gushing out. It was his own hands and feet into which the spikes were driven. Why? So that not only could we be forgiven, but that we could see when jealousy is about to become hatred and when hatred is going to become something even greater than. So that we could see sin coming and say, I will not go down this road because I know where it's going to lead and I know the Holy Spirit will help me not to do it. That's what the meaning of Jesus' death is. It is not just forgiveness. It's the capacity to understand the nature of sin, the insidious nature of sin, that it starts in the heart. And that it leads from one thing. You can't stop this thing once it gets going. And that's exactly what happened to the brothers of Joseph. 
Paul says it this way in his letter to his young pastor friend Titus. He says, the grace of God came to this world so that we could say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We're going to come to the Lord's table now. And I'm going to invite you to come to the Lord's table. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you do not know him personally, if you do not know that that unbelievable sense of being clean inside, when we repent, when we recognize that we are sinners and we say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. That's the only way we'll ever receive his forgiveness if we say, I know I'm a sinner. That's the only basis. But I, I want to go beyond that this morning and challenge all of us who are believers to look inside, to ask the question, what's the condition of my heart? What does my heart breed most easily? Is my heart a heart that always sees the worst possible scenario here, makes the judgment that nothing good can ever come here? In my eulogy for my mom, I quoted my father, and it was absolutely the truth. My mother's could see the good in everyone. And that, that spirit of being able to see the good in everyone has just permeated my life in the last week as I've thought about the legacy of my mom to me. I want that. I want that set of me when I'm an old man. The only way that happens, the only way that happens is if we understand that our tendency as human beings is to find something bad and then to build on that. <laughs> and then it takes to take off. It just absolutely has a life of its own. The only way to nip that in the bud is to be aware of the pang of conscience, to be able to see what's taking place, and to say, no. That's my challenge for you as believers this morning. Not just live in this state of forgiveness, which is wonderful, and that's where we start. But go beyond that. How much does my life mirror the image of Jesus that he would put into my heart through his spirit. So the sin of Joseph's brothers, it was jealousy, it was hatred, and then it was contempt to the point of plotting murder. That's always the way sin is. Start small, gets big. The thing that we as believers can do is say, I will not go it's the Holy Spirit that helps us. It's what he wants to do in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this story from the pages of the Old Testament. It's amazing that you worked in such remarkable ways, such powerful ways, with a 17-year-old boy. Lord, I thank you for our young people and young adults. And I just ask this morning that you would bless them, that you would help them to be the, the leaders, the spiritual leaders that so often speak into the lives of we who are older, with their enthusiasm, with their discernment, with their sensitivity to the, to the reality of sin, but calling it like they see it. 17-year-old boy named Joseph Hills is going to change the history of Israel. Yes, there were unwise things on everyone's part, but it did not provide sufficient reason for what his brothers did. Or maybe someone here this morning is deeply wounded and would like to respond in kind pray, Jesus, this morning that you help us to know that sin starts in the heart and then it gets out of control. We can't control it any longer.
becomes how we end up defining ourselves. Thank you that you would help us by your spirit to see sin coming and to say, no, I will not go there. We thank you in 